Hey everyone, we're back with another week of Find Your Film. This is the week ending September 3rd, 2022. We have a lot of really interesting movies to cover this week. We have a powder keg of cinema. Eric Holmes, do we not? Yes, this will be an explosive episode for sure. Explosive ep- What do you think, Brucey the Eagle? Will, will it be a explosive show? I'm Brucey the Beagle. Be- Beagle, Get I'm sorry. Right. My, my, my cataracts and glaucoma <laughs> and, and blindness was creeping up. It's going to be it's going to be explosive. Yes. Explosive. Yes. How has it been so far this week for you guys it's regarding movie watching? I'm looking at the list. You guys have watched like maybe 10 or 12 movies or something. It seems like <laughs> that. Bruce, do you have a, a special one this week that, you, that you're really excited to talk about? What's the one movie that you're really looking forward to as far as this episode? I don't know. There's a few cool movies to talk about this week. I mean, I think it'll be fun to talk about Candyman for sure. Okay, Cause I know Eric watched it. I, and I just saw everything on Eric's list. I was like, okay, I'll watch everything on Eric's list. <laughs> so basically I just watched them all. Well, the caveat for this episode is Bruce. I know this might be your favorite film out of all of them, but we can't devote the entire episode talking about sweet girl. Okay. I just want you to know that. And I know Eric Holmes, you're missing out on, on a classic film in sweet girl. Jason Momoa and Isabella Merced. Are you excited to see that Netflix film? Or maybe have you already seen Sweet Girl, Eric Holmes? No, that was the one uh, of the uh, 30 movies on our list for this week. That was the one that I did not get to. You know, it's like watching a whole bunch, getting a list of the top, what, films from the 40s. And then like we watched nine or 10 of them. But, you know, missing out on Sweet Girl is kind of like missing out on Citizen Kane in the 40s. Would you not agree, Bruce, on that? Well, it was like he wanted to eat like all the meat and potato stuff. And he wanted to save the dessert for last because it's Sweet Girl. There so. you go. That's, it. That's exactly what I was thinking. Sweet Girl. So we're covering Candyman. There are three <laughs> featured films this week that we've all actually seen. I've actually seen this under the gun. I mean, just I just jumped right into the like minutes before the podcast. So we're going to see we're going to review a Netflix film called Worth headlined by Michael Keaton. Again, the aforementioned powder keg with, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm going to get to pronouncing his name when we start reviewing powder keg, but it's basically the King Slayer from Game of Thrones. And last but not least, Bruce and Eric, they're going to kind of, they're going to do a rewind on this slasher slash Neo Jallo film called The Last Matinee. I'm very interested to see what Bruce and Eric think of this movie. They received screeners last week for The Last Matinee. And then also we're going to be covering Bruce's box movie this week. And it's going to be, uh, oh, oh, and Eric, you've already seen this. Are you, guys, is the box movie that we're going to tease, is it really, does it fly? Does, it, does this movie fly? Does it have wings? Here it comes. Bruce, what do you think? Does it have wings or is it grounded? It flies, uh, not as much as a Nordic person would fly, but it flies. Okay. Okay, good. And then <laughs> last but definitely not least, Eric, you, have a, you know, the good thing that adorns your wall is you have a whole bunch of movie posters for our listeners. You can check out the Deepest Dream YouTube to, to check out Eric's adornments on his wall. He has Lose the Flower of Evil. He has Blue Ruin. You love movie posters, right? I do. Why would you watch a movie about movie posters? Is it really interesting? What do you think? Mm, might, hmm? be. might be. Might be. Might be. get into that. <laughs> we might definitely get into that. Okay. So that's it. Oh, also for our promo, I, I we last week we actually did a William Friedkin director spotlight again. And this was my my shot to actually watch Jade for the first time. So we saw Jade. And the hunted. So we, I'm gonna put that up later this week. Now, whose turn is it to do the director spotlight? Who, who's is it Bruce's turn or is it Eric's turn? Have you guys? I think thought it's about my this? turn. I think it's my turn next because I think Eric did Kubrick, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it would be Bruce's. It would be Brucey the Eagles. So in about three weeks from now, Bruce, what do you think? What do you have any ideas? A couple names you're throwing around or the thing things you're I thinking can give about? You guys a ch- I'm gonna give you guys a choice. Okay, let's hear um, it. It can either be. Two movies by directors that are famous for not being directors, or it could be two lesser talked about movies by a very famous director. Mm. I'm going to go with the latter. What do you think, Eric? Or are you going to be tricky? I I, I, I want to be tricky, but uh, mostly I just want to know what both of them are because my curiosity (laughs) is getting the best of me. But we've never done a spotlight on two directors before, so... That could be a fun thing. Eric, I'm going to correct you. We did actually. We kind of went. It was me. Know, did, <laughs> you know, Mario Bava and Dario Argento. That was kind of a mixture. Well, I, 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 I'm talking about like pure uh, one. two of them. I, it, that's, uh, that, yeah. that's right. The two directors did both movies or did I mishear you? Yeah, Bruce, did we mishear you regarding your first choice? No, you, know, you heard me right. I think that'll lead to a lot more research having to be done. So we can probably stick with the famous director, but two 
which we haven't talked about yet, and two underseen movies by that director. Well, let's um, do that then. Okay. And that would be. And it's you gotta tell me what the two directors are because that's gonna kill me. <laughs> uh, I'll save it. I'll save it for another time. Uh, oh, and, you, and Bruce, Bruce doesn't mind. Yeah, killing Eric Holmes in the process. Very sociopathic of you, Bruce. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, in, I don't know, two or three weeks from now, we're going to do Robert Wise. We are not going to do The Haunting. We're not Mm going to do The Sound of Music. We're going to do early, early film by him called The Body Snatcher. Okay. With Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. And we're going to do a later film by him called Andromeda Strain. All right. Very good choice. Robert Wise, he's considered one of the best and best of the best. Isn't that a a, uh, Michael Crichton? Crichton book early Michael Crichton it might be the, the first Michael Crichton movie adaptation I'm not positive but it might be yeah why did you come upon so why Robert, Robert Wise you just wanted to research him a little bit more Bruce you may I'm thinking maybe you love the haunting so much well, or something like that I love the haunting and I was like okay well you already talked about the haunting and everyone knows the haunting even though it's sort of underseen compared to some of his like musicals and stuff and those are all really well known so I thought um, it's been a long, long time since I've seen The Body Snatcher and probably since I was in high school. So I, I thought it'd be kind of fun to go see a really old movie. Like that's like, I can't remember the 40s or 50s maybe. And then seeing a movie he made in the 70s would be kind of a fun, kind of like we did with the, when we started a Freakin', we kind of did that. So it'd be kind of fun to do that. Okay, so that is for Bruce's director spotlight. That'll happen in about two, three weeks. We're going to cover The Body Snatcher and The Andromeda Strain, like Eric Holmes said. It is based, the, stra- the Andromeda Strain is based on a novel by Michael Crichton. And The Body Snatcher is, sounds like a very creepy movie, but it's probably- Is uh, Body Snatcher at all related to the invasion of the Body Snatchers or? Nope. Ooh. More like Burke and Hare. <laughs> Burke and Hare. Think that. Burke and Hare. What is it? I, I remember Burke. Is that? It's British like really thing? tough hair. <laughs> no, Hare is an H-A-R-E. I think I know that name somewhere. Anyways, that, that'll be interesting in, in a couple of weeks when we cover Robert Wise. But again, later this week, I'll be uploading the freaking podcast. You can check out our thoughts on Jade and The Hunted. First off, our first movie is Worth, headlined by Mo- Michael Keaton. Bruce and Eric, flash round. Favorite Michael Keaton performance. Go. I'm going to say I'm going to start first. Mine, undoubtedly, Michael Keaton in The Founder, playing the founder of McDonald's. Thought that was such a dark movie. Underrated film. I really like his character in Jackie Brown, and then he reprised it in Out of Sight. So I'll go with that. Very good. Very good. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm missing an obvious one where if I sure. hear it, I'll be like, no, that one. This is the first that comes out of your head. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. What was the name of the one where he was with <laughs> the really, really old one where they where they ran the night uh, shift? Um, night shift. Yes, night shift. Yes. Okay, very good. Night very shift. Directed go by old. Ron. Okay, directed by Ron Howard. I'm so, I, you know, I'm with. I'm basically as old as you, Bruce. I'm so old that I actually saw a night shift with my my wonderful late uncle back in the uh, back in Woodland Hills and it's beautiful theater. And I remember loving, I, I remember loving Michael Keaton right off the bat. I just this guy is with me thinking. Did you see it? Did you see Bruce? Did you see Night Shift in the theaters too? Uh, maybe H- VHS. I don't remember, but yeah, yeah. I remember. I, you know, in fact, I haven't seen Night Shift since I think it was released 1982. That was that was a year when movies started really clicking with me. And I remember Michael Keaton's character being such an a-hole and, and overconfident and me thinking this guy's so he's so likable he has a career ahead of him and almost 40 years later he definitely had a career ahead of him and he continues to have a career now michael keaton he is the lead in the new netflix film worth he plays mediator kenneth feinberg and he takes it upon himself even though he has a busy law law firm to head up with his partner camille biros played by amy ryan very very good actress amy ryan so amy ryan michael keaton they they headline the movie worth but ultimately, Feinberg takes it upon himself to actually you know, take over the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund. He is spearheading that along with members from his firm, including the aforementioned Camille Biros, played by Amy Ryan. 80% Priya. That's our target from the DOJ. If we don't hit that number, the plan won't work. Any fewer claimants come aboard, the lawsuits that result could crater the economy. So we're told. No pressure, people. Uh, for every claimant, we'll need to calculate a dollar value for the human loss, whether it's loss of limb or loss of life. Most of the people who died that day were providers for their families. We can't bring them back, but we can help their loved ones pay their bills. Now you people understand we're not going to be able to haggle every case subjectively. That's where the math comes in. So we're, uh, we're going to need a rubric. 
These are the latest actuarial tables from the top casualty and life insurance companies, and we'll use these numbers as a basis. Yeah, you guys study up on these and help Camille come up with a proposal. Eventually, he locks horns with a guy named Charles Wolfe, played by Stanley Tucci, who lost a loved one in the attacks. And this movie, I, you know, it hits select markets on Friday and then comes out on Netflix on September 3rd, obviously based on a true story. And I really enjoyed his performance. This is one of those movies that I think it's really tough to take because of the subject matter, but I think it's a really, really first-rate drama that I don't know if it's going to cast a wide net over like everyone's going to love it. I think it really uh, hit home. It's a really well-done drama with solid performances. Eric Combs, your thoughts on Worth? Well, first of all, I liked it. It kind of reminded me of the movie Dark Water. It kind of had that similar kind of, uh, you know, ongoing court thing or illegal bullshit that they have to go through. Michael Keaton doing, and I think he did this in Spotlight with his accent. That always throws me off, like every time. And not because he doesn't do a good accent. It's just, I'm so used. It, it'd be like if, I don't know, it'd be like if Al Pacino started doing the Christopher Walken a- accent. It, it definitely stand out because I'm used to Al Pacino being Al Pacino. So whenever like Michael Keaton gets an accent, it throws me off. But, you know, I'm settled into it eventually. Except for the one scene where he kind of lost the accent for like, <laughs> there was one line he lost the accent. And I'm like, this is weird again. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Tucci, he's one of those actors like, I, you know, I don't hate Stanley Tucci at all. In fact, I like him. This movie, I liked him a lot. And I think this is this is probably the first Stanley Tucci movie that I could think of. I, I, he was a margin call for like five seconds, so you can't really count that. But this is the first movie I re- recall seeing Stanley Tucci in where I'm like, wow, I've, this guy's fucking good. I like him a lot in this. Yeah. The story itself kind of, and this probably has more to do with the real life stuff as opposed to the writing or anything. But one of the things that uh, frustrated me with this movie or the story rather was the fact that, you know, Michael Keaton's character is trying to do what he thinks is right. And everyone hates him for it because it's he's not doing what they want. But the problem is, at least according to the movie, the people don't express their demands. So then he's just left with, well, this is what we can get. You know, I know this isn't the best, but this is what I know I can get. And if I go for the, you know, if I go for the other thing, um, we may get it, we may not. And you could be left with nothing. So let's go the safe route. I do like how this movie kind of, I, I don't know if it did this intentionally or not, but it felt like it was pointing out the, uh, if you want to fight for something, it's good to make your demands known up front. That way, you know what you're fighting for. And there seemed to be a lot of frustration with this character. It's like, well, they don't know what he want. They don't know what they want. So I'm just going to do this. And then Stanley Tucci's, you know, he, he butts heads with them a bit. And then it, you know, figures itself out somewhat. But yeah, the, the, overall, this was a good movie. And it's it's not a courtroom drama, but it's courtroom adjacent. So it's kind of right up my alley anyway. <laughs> and uh, yeah, check it out. It's on Netflix. Bam. So the idea of worth, Bruce, is that I, the reason why Feinberg is an expert at this is he knows when the, when a disaster strikes or a catastrophe strikes, he comes up with some equation regarding the, the actual worth of a human life within this calamity or, or catastrophe tragedy. And he applies that logic and those equations along with members of his firm within with the 9-11 attacks and with the victim compensation fund. So I think one of the complaints that might be levied against the movie is worth really centers on the maybe, I'm not going to say coming of age or maybe the transformation of Kenneth Feinberg regarding this two-year experience, as opposed to really focusing on, on the victims, the families and whatnot. Even though their stories are mentioned, they're mentioned in lieu of how it maybe changes him do you see that as a criticism or do you think people will just say, hey, no, this is a very, very good movie. Really enjoyed work. Yeah, I do kind of see that as a criticism, actually. I, I kind of one of the problems I sort of had with this movie, because Eric mentioned um, Dark Waters, which I thought of as well. This is one of those kind of procedurals that a lot of times works for like a whistleblower or something like that, where you're going to have to basically you know, uncover the conspiracy or uncover the the dirty doings of some big corporation or whatever. And here the stakes were kind of strange. I thought, I think that was the problem for me. It was really dry. And that, that the stakes were basically this, you've got a guy who just does numbers and he's trying to figure out the worth of all these people who died in nine 11. And he has to learn to not just use numbers. 
like you said, that's to me, that's not really very dramatic. There's nothing to it. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Like we know that's what he needs to do. And him getting to that point isn't much of a story. So they do kind of throw in some various, I guess they're kind of avatars for a lot of the stories that probably actually occurred out there. So they give us a few kind of subplots so we can kind of get an idea of the different kinds of things they might've had to deal with and how that made it complicated. Once again, I thought that was kind of obvious and kind of basic too. To me, this movie was way too dry and was the wrong focus. This wasn't dramatic. It wasn't, I mean, I almost would have rather had us follow you know, the three or four main stories and have them trying to fight for what they needed to get to like survive. That would have been more of a story to me. So you don't recommend this movie? I don't. I think it's, I think it's just, it's, it's kind of deadly dull. It really Ooh, is. Really, really. Yeah. And I like, I mean, all in on paper, all the parts are there. Like the acting's fine. The, the, the actors are great. The production is good, but I don't think there's much to it. Yeah. I think, I think for me, I, I enjoy this movie. You know, even with its flaws, like overall, I'd, I'd give this a recommendation, especially if you love Michael Keaton's work. It's one of, he's one of those actors where you can just hang a suit or a dress on and he or she, they can just carry the movie. It doesn't really matter. I think Worth actually is a little bit more of an upscale narrative wise. I, I liked it a little bit more than you. And then on top of that, I upscaled it with Michael Keaton's performance. I think Amy Ryan should have, that was woefully underused. She is a dynamite actor. We, we needed a little bit more of Amy Ryan. I mean, it's one of these things. Yeah, th this whole story is dry. We know what happens if you just Google what happens. Did this? Did they come on time with this uh, September 11th victim compensation fund? Did they come through with it? If you can just Wikipedia, there's not too much drama there. I think you just really, it, but if you're actually invested in the human stories as well as Keaton's performance worth, could be worth watching. I give it a solid recommend. Eric, do you, you do you give it a, a slight recommend? Because you're kind of in between both of us, I think, with this movie. Yeah, yeah, I, I I would give this a pretty strong recommend actually. Oh, good. Um, I will say though, to your point, and I'm sure Bruce might agree with this. With movies like this, when they finish the movie, and then they do the title cards of what happens. Sure. Maybe, and this isn't the only movie that d does this. In fact, we're gonna talk about another movie that does this exact same thing. Maybe it would be a better idea to reframe the story or uh, cut it up in a different way to where you can show that ending because it, it like it, it would make sense if it was like a, they were doing a movie of an ongoing story and as they were editing it or once they were done shooting there was new information then they got to put the title cards up because there's just not time to shoot it because this thing just happened that makes sense but you know when when you're uh, talking about a you know historical drama all this stuff already happened so why not just re kind of reconsider the story and then just uh make it to where instead of just doing title cards at then you can have that satisfying ending of oh sorry spoilers <laughs> but you can yeah, have that it's not, it's not too much of a spoiler not at all <laughs> you can have that satisfying ending of uh show us what happened you know, show us the show us the end of the the court, whatever proceedings, or show us how everything panned out, and then end it there, as opposed to end it like kind of almost halfway through the story, and then title card the rest of it. But again, that being said, I still liked it, but I I eat these type of movies up for breakfast so <laughs> <laughs> bruce <laughs> I, I think you kind of you actually did when you were describing that it kind of brought to mind like i think what my kind of one of my biggest problems is even if the story kind of stayed the way it was i didn't really feel like i understood how michael keaton's character changed like what did he do differently like i never saw them figure out the worth do you know what i'm saying yeah like we saw uh, we saw a change slowly in the the approach but I didn't see how that resulted or what, what resulted from that approach. It was just I, like, yay. <laughs> you know I, what I mean? I think his change came more from before he's just real pragmatic about everything. The, right. This is what the numbers show. And this, you know, not, he's not looking to get the money that people need. He's looking to get the money that he's sure that he can get. Like, it, I know for, I a don't fact, know what that I know, looked like. I, I, well, <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying like, I know you need a thousand, but I can for sure get you a hundred, which is better than nothing. If we go for the yeah. thousand, which we probably won't get. And then after talking with Stanley Tucci's character, that's where he's, you know, that there was that whole scene where he's like, I don't know what to do. What do you want me to do? You know, that, that whole scene. And so he just, I, I, I guess his main change comes from just 
doing the same thing, but coming at it from a different perspective. And I think it helps, it helped him kind of be more successful, I guess, yeah. in, in getting what he wanted or be not, human, not what he wanted, but getting <laughs> what other people wanted. And then that goes back to the uh, people not explaining what they want. You know, what, what are your demands? This thing happened to you. What are your demands? I want you to fix it. That's not a demand. <laughs> That's a generalization. What do you want? I want $30 million. Okay. I can, at least that's a number. I can aim for that, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I think his, uh, his change wasn't so much of an emotional change because he did want to help people. At least I, that's what I got from him. He just wanted to, uh, he didn't know how to do it properly, I guess, or successfully. Eric, uh, were you ever bored during this movie while you're watching it? Were you bored at all? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, look. but again, I'm the kind of guy that likes to read the uh, owner's manual of a car. I find great joy in that. And most people <laughs> don't. <laughs> well, I mean, different strokes for different folks. Would you yeah. ever read an encyclopedia of jazz essays, Eric, or would you be? Yeah, would... probably. Okay. No, you're, you're, you're a man of many, uh, you're, you're a man of the world, but yeah, no, I agree with you. I was surprisingly not bored whatsoever with worth so that is a strong recommendation from eric holmes i give it a solid recommendation on, on my part bruce perky as a counterpoint calls this movie deadly dull and does not recommend does not recommend worth so th that take all those opinions in and tell us what you think of worth when it hits theaters select theaters and also netflix on friday september 3rd next up this is you know we wanted to lighten things up this week a little bit so i decided you know after worth there, there's a movie with Nikolai, Nikolai Koster Waldau. He's a King Slayer from Game of Thrones. Powder Keg looks like a really cool action movie. I just thought it was an action. I thought this movie was an action movie, like an idiot. I I failed to, I just looked at Nikolai or Nikolai Koster Waldau and he's he's the he's the lead. I'm I'm thinking, yeah, let's go for it. I forgot to read the plot summary of Powder Keg. It's based on true events. It's based on the 2015 shooting in Copenhagen. Copenhagen, Copenhagen. Bruce, tomato, tomato. What do you think? Eric, what do you think? Copenhagen or Skull. Copenhagen? Potato, <laughs> potato. Okay, let's, let's go uh, with saying Copenhagen. So here's the thing. This, is, this movie, it's based on the shootings. Okay. You can, again, like Worth, you can Wikipedia it, Google it, know what happened. But here's the thing. Powder Keg, it's, it's basically interwoven stories that ultimately will lead up to the ending. So your enjoyment of or it's hard to say enjoyment regarding Powder Keg because it's such a downbeat and bleak movie. It can't be a happy movie because of the events, but you, you follow the lives of the aforementioned Kingslayer, Waldau, Kasher Waldau. He plays a burnt out SWAT member. He, his back is, is failing him. He is on the last days of his life on the force and he hates it. He is divorced. He loves his family, but he's, he's just at wit's end. He, I mean, He's a good looking guy. Even his Tinder dates, even though he does pretty well on Tinder dates, sometimes he's just so downbeat that sometimes his Tinder dates don't even want to be with him. So he's really on the last rung. You also follow another person. Just He's a radical. He's a radical Muslim who wants to commit chaos and violence in his area. And he's, he's released from jail based on appeals, based on the appeal system. So he's out for a little bit and he's making a big plan. And then there's, there's another person. He's a journalist filmmaker who believes in free speech. And then we follow another person, a Jewish security guard who really wants to improve his station and find a, a job, I believe, in the financial business. So we follow all these different lines throughout the narrative. And it's really your enjoyment of Powder Keg really focuses on whether you find these stories either evocative, moving, or just more, most importantly, just watchable. And I found Powder Keg to be, it is a bleak movie, but I found myself really invested in the stories. And ultimately to the ending, obviously there are fic fictionalized moments in this movie, but overall the ending really hits you. And I found myself, again, another solid recommendation regarding Powder Keg. It's just one of these things that you, it, I think even more than worth, you just really need a huge investment in these people because it's really, really downbeat what you're going to go through watching Powder Keg. Bruce Perky, your thoughts on Powder Keg? My guess is you like this better than Worth. Yeah, I did like it better than Worth. I, I mean, I, I, I'd say this is a, a medium medium to solid recommend. It's it's pretty pretty good. I think that not knowing much about this particular event probably helped me because I, I the expectation was just kind of vague dread. You know what I mean? Like you knew it was leading to something, obviously. And it was just in the, this also, I don't think we mentioned it. This is in the aftermath of the Charlie Hebdo attacks 
this is like within weeks of that. So there's, it's, it's already kind of in the air. This actually kind of felt to me in some ways, a little bit, not as stylized, but a little bit like elephant. you know, that movie yeah. where you, where this is like, it's one of those movies where you follow all these people and you, you, you figure they're going to intersect or partially intersect, or something's going to happen. That's going to bring these people together. You just don't know how it's going to happen. And I also appreciated, and once again, this, for some people, this might not be action packed enough. They might want this to be more of a, you know, I mean, it's a real event, but they might want it to be more action packed. They but heard I the name powder keg and they want <laughs> Yeah, Scott right. Atkins to come mm-hmm. in. <laughs> but for me, okay. um, what I appreciate about it was it just kind of had this slowly simmering dread and tension that kind of got built up. And the longer you stay with these people, the more you kind of understand where they're at and where they're, you know, that you get to know their lives and you start to worry, like, who's going to live? Who's going to die? And the other thing I did appreciate about this movie was it had that feel of reality and that things didn't happen in a heroic way things happened in a very messy way. Like nothing went to plan from any side. I thought it was pretty good. This is a pretty solid movie. Yeah, I was pretty surprised. I I liked it too. Like you, Bruce, I give it a solid recommend. Another caveat though, the ending of the movie, there is one split second moment at the ending, which I said, no, you know, you, you, you just hammered that nail a little bit too hard into the wood. And, and, and you, you, you just, it's in the, now the nail, I don't even know how to hammer things. So the nail is all the way in the house. You can't find it anymore, but that's just a little minor quibble. Eric Holmes, your thoughts on powder keg. Oh, overall, I liked it pretty much the first half where they're kind of uh, building up everything. Well, first of all, the, the character that's got back pain and goes on useless Tinder dates. I totally relate to all of that, <laughs> <laughs> but uh <laughs> But uh, I guess the first half was kind of a, a little slow for me because because they brought up the Charlie Hebdo thing. And there, I mean, there's there's interesting things to say and reveal about that. I think they could have got into that more and they really didn't. They kind of went. Uh, what was the uh, the the guy's name? The uh, guy that got out of prison, I believe. I, let me see. Omar. Yeah, Omar. I don't know if he's an, a real character or a composite or or what the case is with him. But I do know that a lot of these attacks are heavily inspired by religion. And I didn't get the sense that he was religious at all. He seemed like a guy that's like, well, this is a thing I got to do. And he kind of played lip service to, oh, we're going to, you know, uh, be, you know, ever virgins with Allah and everything. I think they mentioned that once kind of, but they didn't really, they didn't really dive into. And again, this, may, this may have been the the actual person didn't believe in that. Maybe he's just some guy that, you know, Hey, I get out of prison. I do this thing, you know, but it, it would have been neat to see someone that's like, so, you know, so locked into the religion that they do something that they might not otherwise do. And if only one day someone could write a script and make a movie about that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, funny. <laughs> yeah, inside <laughs> joke, moving on. Uh, but, uh, overall, uh, this, this movie was, uh, pretty good. Um, I, I just kind of wish it dug its, dug its heels in a little more and got, got a little, in, instead of making it kind of a tone poem almost. Like really got into the, really got into the weeds of the political and the religious ramifications of everything that's going on. Um, Did did you get the sense that maybe part of that, what you're reacting to, what we probably all are reacting to is that this might be for the audience where it was made. They might know this story a lot better already. Maybe. So they might, they might already have a a huge kind of expectation built up to it. Like if this is a 9-11 movie. And we knew it was about 9-11. We were following characters. We already know kind of what's going to be facing, especially if it was like famous people who had been involved in it. And yeah. this might be, these might be kind of famous people to then they might assume a lot from the audience that we're not coming with. Yeah. I'm just thinking. I, I, I think that that's actually exactly what it is. Cause I, I did find myself kind of filling in a lot of the blanks, but I followed this kind of stuff, you know, yeah. I'm not, not uh, that deep into Charlie head though, but I know enough about it to, in, the political and religious stuff behind it that I can kind of fill in the blanks, but let's say you're 20 something, you know, you were a kid when all this happened, you didn't follow that. And so you watch this movie and be like, I'm kind of confused, like, or 
or maybe this is a movie that'll maybe you want to look you know uh, go into wikipedia and uh, do some research about it later on i, d- I don't know but for me it, it, that first half of the movie just seemed like a uh, missed opportunity that there was a lot of internal you know people staring at walls and <laughs> contemplating yeah. things yeah. where you could have spent that time really digging into and explaining or showing the all the interesting stuff it, and by the way none of this stuff is good like none of this is happy stuff but it's it's definitely interesting and just seems kind of like a missed opportunity to not delve into that that being said it's still a cool movie and the last half is really good and it, it, it's shot in a way that it feels like you're there which is yeah. not a pleasant feeling but for what they're going for in this movie, it's absolutely kind of what it needs to be. So, yeah, I think it's for me. Yeah, I recommend. I'm glad that you liked it, Eric. And uh, even with that, with that flaw, I also, by, do you guys agree? By the time that happens, you're actually invested in the characters. So even though it was a slow yeah. build, Eric, I mean, we, Eric, we, by the time that happened, we actually, yeah, you were oh, invested. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Were, yeah. So I think if it didn't do that, this movie would be, would be a big failure because there's four stories and, and the filmmakers telling us like, hey, you're going to spend time. You're not going to see the Kingslayer for 20 minutes. You, you're going to have other, you're going to have other story. You're going to have to sip through. And I was surprised. Scott Atkins is not showing up. And Scott <laughs> Atkins is not showing up. And when, when we say powder keg. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil this, but uh, the scene in the apartment towards the end. Okay. Just leave it there. That, that part yeah. broke my heart. Oh uh, yeah. Of it kind of, kinda, of course, it kind of yeah. went on. It went on a lot longer than those scenes tend to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it just made it, it just made it worse. Not worse like this movie, that part sucked, but worse in that, like, like my heart's just, yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there, but you guys know what I'm talking about. And if you watch it, you'll know exactly the scene I'm talking about. And to Bruce and Eric's point, again, this, yeah, this centers on people trying to move on or trying to process the, the re, that terrorist attack on Charlie Hebdo. And when you mentioned Powder Keg, we were joking about it's not a Scott Atkins film. It's not an explosive action movie. Powder Keg, and it's not a spoiler, it's in relation to the main characters in this narrative. Each of them are dealing with their own personal powder keg and frustrations with their own lives. Ultimately, those things come to a head. And yeah, I, you know, it started off slow for me, Eric, as well. I, as the movie progressed, I, I found myself really saying, oh, I'm so glad I ended up liking this. Okay, so that I guess we agree. All solid yep. recommends from all three of us yep. for Powder Keg. Okay, yes. so Powder, yes, Powder Kegs comes out in theaters, select theaters, September 3rd via Samuel Goldwyn Films. Now, another, some rewinds. So we're done with our movie. Oh, wait, wait, no, we're not done with our movies. You know what? Let's just switch things over. It's not even a rewind, but Candyman. Bruce and Eric, you saw Candyman. A, uh, who, who wants to start off? Bruce, you want to start off first? Or was it Eric? You want to start off with Candyman? Um, I would say Eric because he rewatched the original one too. So he's probably got a little more context. Yes. Okay. Well, Eric, I'm going to ask you, some people who love the original ended up watching the re- uh, not, uh, did a remake or the follow-up or something like that with Candyman. And they ended up being disappointed with this Candyman. How did you feel rewatching the original and then now watching this? Were you pleasantly surprised? Did you love it? Et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, I hated the original. I saw it when I was a kid and it was, uh, it was uh, sold to us as the scariest movie ever. And we watched it on HBO in the middle of the afternoon with me and my brothers, just arms crossed going, all right, scare us. And okay, did not do that. I'm um, going to edit that for uh, Eric. I'm just going to edit that from the, from the podcast because any movie starring, if I recall, Virginia Madsen is, is uh, will have to be the best movie ever made. Because Virg- I'm interviewed. And Ted um, Raimi. And Ted Raimi. <laughs> hashtag name dropping Greg. Uh, I interviewed her several years ago and Virginia Madsen said, oh, Deepest Dream. That's the name of your website. That's a really cool name. So how dare you on the original Candyman? That is edited. I'm just kidding. So you didn't like it. Go ahead. Go on that so, train. Why you didn't so like it? I, 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 I did not like the original Candyman. Mm-hmm. And then uh, watched the, uh, I, I went to the theater and watched the uh, new Candyman, which by the way, um, and I've heard a couple of people mention this. And I thought the exact same thing. The titles are backwards. Do not go talk to the people saying that the, the movie's messed up because it is not as a stylistic choice. And it's, the frame is not backwards. Bruce is laughing. I'm guessing you had the same. <laughs> you, you had the same. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anywho. Yeah. So uh, the, the <laughs> I see the MGM logos backwards. Then I see the Braun logos backwards. 
and then I see the monkey paw logos backwards, and then it uh, it has the the opening scene, and there's no words. I just assume that's backwards too. And so I go out and tell the people, I'm like, yeah, I don't know if this is a stylistic choice or there's something wrong <laughs> with your projector, but the movie's backwards. And they're like, what are, you, what are you talking about? It's like it's like mirror flip. And then I started thinking about it, and I'm like, oh. Never mind. And we get back there, and sure enough, <laughs> as soon as we walk in, there's a cop car with numbers on the side. And it's like, yeah, it was just a stylistic choice. Never, don't don't listen to me. So <laughs> I missed like the opening minute of the movie. <laughs> but uh, anywho, uh, beyond that, the movie I I love this movie. I you know found it fantastic. There was the 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 story. Um, I found out later that the story is kind of recreates the story of the original Candyman. I found that out later because, as I mentioned, I haven't seen it since I was a kid. So after watching this movie, I went home and I'm like, I want to watch that movie again, but I don't want to take the bus to the movie theater just yet. So fuck, maybe I'll just watch the original Candyman again. I watch it. Okay, now I kind of like Candyman. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, really, I, I I think when I watched it as a kid, I just wasn't ready for it, and then just being set up the way I was of this is going to be the scariest movie. Like I I wasn't. I, that's not a good way to to come into a movie of uh you know just already you know already thinking the movie owes you something walking into it and then it not delivering what you think it should when it's not supposed to be that at all and so now i kind of want to watch the new candy man again having watched the original because i think i because the original candy man even though it's better than what i remembered it's also pretty simple but I think the stuff that happens in the new Candyman kind of elevates the original one, at least. It, but again, I'm I'm no one. No one has my sort of take on the original Candyman. It, it's, it's pretty unique. So I don't know how this helps other people, uh, you know, how it would make them gauge the movies. But I, I did think kind of like when uh, I saw Prometheus, this is a bad example, because I love Alien, but I saw Prometheus. I'm like, this movie makes me like Alien even more. And I love Prometheus, but it just, and then I just went, after I watched that movie, I went back and watched Alien again. I'm like, oh, this movie's even better now. And I think the new Candyman did that for me with the old Candyman movie. And the, the ending to this, well, first of all, stylistically, the, the whole movie's got that kind of Jordan Peele kind of look to it. I can't quite put my finger on what that is. And this was directed by Nia DaCosta. So, it, you know, Jordan Peele was just, but it still had that same kind of look to it. But man, that ending was freaking cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, I super high, high recommend of Candyman. And I would say uh, if you've never seen the original Candyman or it's been a while, I would say watch that, then go watch the uh, new Candyman. So they tie in together pretty well, you think? Yeah, it's it's uh, I can't say how because that would be total spoilers, but um, sure. yeah, they they tie in quite intimately, I would say. I used to have a VHS copy of Candyman way back in the day. Bruce, what is your own relationship to the original Candyman? Did you watch it on VHS as well, or did you were you a fan of the original and going into this version, were you pleasant? Were you uh, surprised or pleasantly surprised, or did you love it as much as Eric did? I did love it as much as Eric did. I wasn't a super fan of the original. I liked it. I, I didn't dislike it, but I wasn't like, it wasn't like my favorite movie of the nineties, like horror movie or whatever, but I thought it was good. It was a solid horror movie. I thought, but I wasn't like a super fan. I feel like a lot of people that don't like this one are super fans or really, really love that original Candyman, And, and this doesn't work for them. But I think that anybody going into this movie, this is definitely for a sequel slash reimagining, whatever you want to call it. This is more in the camp of things like the new Suspiria or those kind of movies that really do something interesting with the property. They don't just retread it or just crap all over it and make something really terrible. This is a really interesting movie uh, in its own right. Honestly, you don't even have to watch the original Candyman. You could watch this as a standalone. But like Eric says, it is enriched, I think, a lot if you do kind of have at least a familiarity with the original one. It kind of gives you that extra appreciation. This movie is really stylish. Once again, I mean, I think that Eric would agree the the opening credits are fantastic. The soundtrack is fantastic. The closing credits are fantastic. This is another one of those movies where it takes the closing credits and just gives you more movie. 
which is amazing. I mean, there's no reason to leave this movie until the very final credit rolls. You, you, if you do, I don't, I guess you just didn't like the movie at all. The acting's good. It's not super gory. So that's something, some people that really want a lot of gory killings and horror, this isn't too hardcore in that way. So some people might be a little disappointed if it's not like enough, you know, like visceral horror. But I think the way that they do the horror and the, the gore in this movie is really stylish and interesting. And I know Eric would probably agree with me. There's a scene that's done, that's shot from, from way far away. There's a killing that happens from a distance. Oh, you're watching yeah. it. Yeah. That, and that is. I completely forgot, but that's probably the best one. Fucking and- amazing. <laughs> and they do a lot of really interesting stuff. Great character stuff. I mean, there's all the the stuff about race and everything in here too, which once again, I've heard people complain that this is like all woke and everything. And it's like the original movie was all about race. <laughs> so if that's your complaint, you are not paying attention at all. So this movie, I think is just solid all the way around. And, and they talk about the quote elevated horror. This is, this is just a good movie. It's worth seeing. Okay. I, I also wanted to, uh, it, it's not that gory, but. And I didn't. I didn't know this was a thing, but apparently it is. Uh, people that have a fear of holes, like a bunch of tiny holes put together. I I found out like a couple months ago this was a thing, and this movie has that. So if you're one of those, I, I'm sure there's a name for it. But if if you're one of those people that see like a bunch of little tiny holes together, and that freaks you out, there's some of that in here, <laughs> and I imagine that would be a. Uh, and pretty bad but yeah this movie's pretty sweet and i thought it would drone on but it really hooked me so <laughs> oh very good very good with, with <laughs> it really hooked you very good eric on that on candy man so that is a very strong recommend for both bruce and eric now yes uh, this movie definitely earns its the buzz it's been getting cool it's now out in theaters and now now out on d- demand on digital and dvd is a movie from uruguay or I like to say Uruguay, called The Last Matinee. It's a little bit of a neo Jallo. It's a slasher, and it centers on a bunch of people in a, in a movie theater. And it's actually a real movie theater. It was in, located in, in Montevideo or Montevideo in uh, Uruguay. And now the thing is, this theater, it's a scary theater. They're, they're watching a, a, The Last Matinee, and a lot of these people in the theater, they're going to be attacked and viciously attacked by a, I don't know, a hoodie wearing killer that's the that's that's the plot of the movie the last matinee eric you, you first what do you think of the last matinee directed and written by maxi contenti well i had to pause this movie pretty early on because it takes place in a theater and there's credits rolling and i'm like pause what does those what are those names i'm looking up the names i can't find them anywhere I pretty much, I guess the whole point of the movie is that they're watching a movie. It's a Frankenstein day of the beast. Was that, was that the name of it? And a bunch of people, well, not a bunch of people, a couple of people here and there about how many people were in the theater. When I saw Candyman was in the theater and there's a killer in the theater and he's just kind of sneaking around one by one, just killing everyone in the movie theater, which quite honestly is pretty clever the way they're able to stage the murders and you know kind of still build that suspense as opposed to killing one people and someone sees it screams and everyone runs out but uh yeah uh so anyway i wanted to watch that movie frankenstein day of the beast because that movie plays throughout the entire movie that's the movie that's playing in the theater as all this stuff's happening and uh as the movie's going on, I'm like, well, maybe I don't have to watch Frankenstein Day of the Beast. It's all right here. <laughs> so that was, it's like watching two movies in one. There's not a whole lot to say about this movie. It's it's pretty straight ahead slasher, but it's got some good kills and just the set the setup of the movie was pretty clever. How they were able to kind of stretch that out through about half the movie until you know you get down to your last couple people, and then everyone's running uh, kind of similar to uh, Blood Red Sky. They're running around in an airplane. I was like, how fucking huge is this airplane? I'm like, how big is this movie theater? (laughs) Because it looks like just a small rinky-dink theater, but like there's a bunch of hidden stuff. One thing that stood out to me, and I think this movie takes place in the 90s, even though the movie, the Frankenstein movie, I guess didn't come out until 2000 something. But I remember seeing movies in the 90s, and I remember there being fire exits in every theater. So I'm kind of wondering where these ones were in this one, but 
other than the certain plot holes that kind of find their way into movies like this. You know, it, it was just a straight ahead slasher and I enjoyed it for what it is. And I also like the uh, Dario Argento opera poster in the background of the uh, hallway. Nice to get Eric Holmes on that again. Same. Eric mentioned Frankenstein, Dave the Beast. The director of that is Ricardo Islas. Ricardo Islas plays the killer in the last matinee. Yeah, oh, it just... <laughs> <laughs> Dad, sorry. You just reminded me. That, that was one thought I had of this. I'm like, what if they remade this movie, but like they were playing groupers in the theater and Anderson was the... Uh... <laughs> The serial killer. That would have been cool. That would have been very cool. Bruce, I don't know if you're a big slasher fan. Did you enjoy The Last Matinee for what it is? Do you have some uh, thoughts on overall thoughts on this movie? I'm not a big slasher fan, but I, I really quite like this movie too. It's got a lot of style and you can tell certain movies. You just get a feel like, you know, this person loves these kind of movies and loves making it. And there's a lot of care put here. I mean, it's got that giallo little sprinkling of of flair to it you know with the the gloved hands and the bright colors and all that and certain things that i think you couldn't fake like that theater when i started watching this i'm like this is a really weird theater i've never been at a theater that has this giant wide staircase right up the middle as you enter into the theater you go up this giant staircase into the theater and that alone was just like that's crazy and it was used to great effect like Here's a perfect example of you have a setting uh, and I, I listen to your interview, which everyone else should listen to that interview if they get a chance. Well, thank you, Bruce. You, you plug my stuff better than me. It's, it's up on our Deepest Dream YouTube channel with Max Contenti. <laughs> thank you very much Bruce, for that. <laughs> but um, he talks about how he had been to that theater and he always thought about using it and he uses it well. So that's a perfect example. And you find an actual location, but utilize it as part of the story and the staircase is used like eric says for movie lovers there's a lot of like background i was constantly looking at little background things like oh what's that oh is that evil dead what is that over there and then just looking at the 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 projector like i was totally fascinated like watching the projector and figuring out how that was working and all that the kills are not cgi they're and they are homages to famous killings that you've seen in a lot of these things too so um i i would say if you like slasher movies definitely it's a must if you like horror movies I think you'll, especially 80s horror movies and 90s horror movies, you'll you'll enjoy this. There's one kill in the last matinee where I'm going, oh, no, no, not. Yes, you that happened. So it, it made me actually care for some of the characters as well. Obviously, with the last matinee, it's an indie horror film, right? So there's not a lot of money to work with. That said, to your point, Bruce, it, the money's well used in the movie, you know, with the a the location, the I guess the, the jalo sprinklings, like you said. And like you said, the killings, the practical effects killing. So, all right. So a recommend for uh, for you, Eric and Bruce, regarding the last matinee on digital DVD and on demand. I recommend if you like slashers. If you don't like slashers, this uh, you're probably not going to like this one. But as slasher movies go, I'd, I'd say this is pretty top tier. Cool. Very cool. Same. Yep. Sweet. Sweet. I, I'm, I'm uh, glad that you guys like this because, again, if you guys listen to the start of the podcast, the start of this whole find your film thing. Maybe even before that with Movie Mainline, both Bruce and, and Eric, they actually hit me on to the whole shallow genre. So I will eternally be grateful to them for that. That's the only reason why I like them as people. Moving forward, just kidding, Eric and Bruce. Okay, Eric Holmes, 24 by 36, a movie about movie posters. I yes. apologize. For, I, I promised I was going to get to it, and I apologize for not getting to this movie poster thing that you've been, I guess, passionate about the last couple of weeks. Bruce, you also already saw it. You also saw it as well. Tell me about this, Eric. Why should people watch a documentary, I'm um, assuming, about movie posters? I can't even remember how I came across this one. I think it was, it had to have been after, was it after we shot, after we recorded the last episode or before? That was after with the, after the loose episode. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I, I just came across it. I, I think I was looking up like probably, uh, I don't know. Drew Struzan or something. And I'm like, oh, here's a thing about movie posters. I will watch that. And it, it goes into the uh, history of movie posters. And it, it's about what you would expect. And then it kind of takes a weird turn because the pretty much the whole last half of the documentary becomes about like the Mondo posters that they have now and the sort of uh, collectors, uh, how, how they become collectors items. And then they start getting into uh, like, like life rights and rights issues and then it started getting me thinking of like uh um you know public domain kind of stuff or you know who 
like the for instance they had you know if you've seen the mondo posters i believe that's one right there a quentin tarantino one with all those movies right there that is very cool that is very nice the, the colors pop actually yeah really nice yeah but uh, so there's these people and they're making these posters and they're like, well, you don't have, you don't have the life rights to so-and-so such and such actor. So you can't make that poster. I'm like, I drew a picture of Sean Penn once. It looked just like him. I don't remember the, uh, I remember the government beating down my door. I didn't feel <laughs> like I, I didn't feel like I was sliding Sean Penn. And to this day, I don't even know why I drew a picture of him. I think it just had the hurly burly DVD there. I'm like, I could probably draw that. And <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it, it, it gets into like really a really weird conversation between it, it's not a conversation between the different poster people, but their interview, you know, they're interviewing them separately and they clearly have different ideas. Like the the Mondo people are like, you have to buy the life rights. And then you have this other guy that's like, I don't got to buy rights to draw a picture of someone. Fuck you. It's my picture. You know, that it seems to be his kind of take on it. So that kind of opened up a really strange conversation in my head and now i kind of got and now it's been a while since i watched the movie so i gotta watch it again <laughs> remember all my thoughts on it but uh th- this was uh this was a really cool movie and just one i accidentally came across on youtube as far as i know it's safe on youtube because that's the only place i've seen it but um i don't know maybe there's uh better places to rent or watch it i don't know i think it's official on youtube it's official to watch it there Okay, well, if okay, that's the cool. case, then watch on YouTube because it's right there. Because it said um, free with ads on the one I got. When it says that, usually it's a, it's one okay. they've, they've sanctioned. So I just know I've gotten in trouble before. Don't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, did you end up liking this one as well? And did t- t- yeah. t- take it, did it take a turn, a good turn when that whole discussion happened within the... Oh, you know? That was all interesting. I mean, to me, the value of this movie, I think for a lot of people, is it, it, it puts in your mind, first of all, the value of art and artists. And also it really helps you understand kind of, well, a couple of things. I always love that thing when you all of a sudden connect like, oh, all those awesome posters were the same artist. And they to do that, especially the golden age of kind of the 60s, 60s through the 80s when there's a lot of illustrated art posters. And then they talk about kind of the dark ages of the 90s and the early thousands when it was all just floating heads. We go into all that. But it also is really interesting because it talks a lot about how a lot of the really early artists didn't even get credited. And there's a lot of information also about the original artwork they create and how they don't own it anymore. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff there around that. And then finally for me, and I don't know if everyone else would react the same way, but this is just like, as you're watching the movie, you're like, oh, great. Now I'm going to have no money anymore because as I'm watching the last third of this movie, I'm writing down the name of all these little studios that make their own Mondo style posters. And I'm going and checking out their sites and like, oh, I can buy posters for 40 bucks that are really awesome. And yeah. That's a whole thing. <laughs> I, I would also say that because uh, Drew Struzan, he's pretty pretty famous poster artist, and he has his he has his own style. And oddly enough, they didn't really bring him up hardly at all in this. I think they might have said his name once, but they brought up a bunch of posters and gave a bunch of different names of a different poster artist. I'm like, oh, I thought that was a Drew Struzan. Oh, I thought that was a Drew Struzan. <laughs> so they showed like, like Norman Rockwell did movie posters. I had no idea. Like I'm familiar with like Norman Rockwell's style. I think most people are, but then to see that he did some movie posters, I'm like, well, I'm going to fucking have to find those. That, that's cool. I didn't know that. So yeah, there's uh they, uh yeah, they, they definitely lend credit to quite a few movie poster artists and good on for that. Well, Eric, like like after watching this like bruce do you are you going to empty some of your coffers and actually buy some mondos i know you have some already like you started adorning your wall or is there a well, space for you to actually get some more posters as long as i don't have to get rid of these two i'll lose yeah as and long as we'll these see. two stay exactly where they're at maybe i can yes. take down the rest of them and then just go around but yeah, yeah. that might, I might have to might have to build some more walls <laughs> just do like a do like a like a cutout pattern just so i have more surface area even though you couldn't like actually see him but yeah well credit goes to bruce and eric for having pure love for cinema and buying movie posters because if i had that 40 dollars, bruce where would i put that money cryptocurrency it's i am i am down <laughs> you know those little holes that eric Eric Holmes was talking about in Candyman. That's actually Greg Srizavosti's soul splayed throughout all those little holes that will never, that recede into nothingness. My life is now just a coin. So that might be. 
we're gonna have to put greg in the crypto zoo here pretty soon <laughs> <laughs> you know what you know emotionally and physically and spiritually i was i was pretty much horned by a unicorn months ago so you're just you're, you guys are just talking to a mummified version of greg's Jews of Ostias. as we speak no this is the okay before we get into the what's in the box i am actually interested to hear what you guys have to say about bob ross i believe this happy accidents betrayal and greed i only know bob ross as that artist that really with a with a fro and the late with a nice smile and paint by paint my numbers in a good way his, his, his work is really beautiful and we used to have a, i used to have a bob ross figure and then when i'd put him put him upside down i'd tell my niece claire up that that's upside down bob ross and that was our, our little joke we would nickname nickname him upside down bob ross is a documentary should my niece see this documentary or is, or is it too dark for her as a five-year-old I would say not. And thankfully, so based on the name, uh, Bob Ross, Happy Accidents, Betrayal and Greed, my first thought was, no, please, that, you know, the world can be a very dark place. Yes. And you, and you have people like Mr. Rogers and Bob Ross that are like, and used to be Bill Cosby that would lift you up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, uh, just forget, cut out there. You even said Bill Cosby. You got people like, <laughs> uh, like, like, hold on, hold on. Let me help you. Woody, Woody Allen. Uh, Kevin Spacey? No, no. Harvey Weinstein? <laughs> no. It's, oh, no. It's okay, well, Harvey Weinstein. Roman Flans. Been there before. <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> but, but, but like Mr. Rogers and uh, Bob Ross, they, they come like their personality on air personality is just really wholesome in the actual, you know, usage of the word, not the uh, back in the day when, you know, women couldn't vote and we were racist. So it was a wholesome back. I'm not talking about that kind of wholesome. I'm talking about like the actual, these are good people. You know, they, they love people. They want to spread joy. And, and Bob Ross was one of those people for me. And I think a lot of other people as well. So when I saw that there was a documentary called Bob Ross, happy accidents, betrayal and greed, my first thought was, Oh fuck. Bob Ross is a shithead is me. Turns out. No, this has, <laughs> the, Very good. Very good. has something to do with uh, other stuff that goes on behind the scenes. But uh, a lot of the uh, documentary is with his son, Steve Ross, and the betrayal and greed come from the uh, producers that were basically producing the joy of painting. And as Bob Ross gets sick and, you know, spoiler alert, Bob Ross is no longer with us. Jim Henson, there's another there's another wholesome dude that yeah. I can get behind. LeVar Burton, great guy. I want LeVar Burton. I just want everyone to hug him because I know he wants to hug everyone. But anyway, I'm getting way off track. But uh, yeah, it, it's about them trying to take Bob Ross's name and IP and likeness and all that on his deathbed. And they're not good people. But before it gets to that, it spends a lot of time uh, with people talking about Bob Ross and you know, their basically thoughts are like, what's he like in, what's he like in real life? And it's like pretty much exactly like he is on TV, maybe a little funnier because, you know, there's certain jokes, you know, that, you know, I, I guess he likes to do blue humor sometimes, which wouldn't fly on public access maybe. So it was a, uh, it was a bunch of nostalgia it made me feel real good up until the end where they showed the assholes that try to, you know, fuck him over and fuck a bunch of other people over and, you know, you got the, you got Bob Ross's light and then you got these producer assholes, which are the exact opposite of them. And of course those two come together because, you know, that's how magnets work. ICP. Now, you know, <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, would you recommend this documentary, Eric? Yes. And for nothing else to just have people, you know, sometimes, you know, like the, the, uh, Mr. Rogers documentary, sometimes you just need to be reminded that there's good people in the world. And even though there's the, Stuff that happened with the producers at the end. A lot of this is a love letter to Bob Ross, and I fucking love it. Agree, Bruce Perky, on Eric's assessment of the doc. Yeah, I'm exactly in the same boat. It's it's this is not gonna, you know, it's not the most amazing documentary in the world, but two thirds of it is pretty much just Bob Ross, how he got to what he got, where he got, who he was as a person why he was that kind of person and how awesome he is. And that's, I mean, that's the meat and potatoes of this documentary. And then all the other stuff is, will make you a little bit sad, but uh, he's so awesome that you can't be all sad because he's just great. So um, yeah, I'd say it's, it's worth watching. Even, especially if you don't know a ton about Bob Ross, like if you're one of those people that just kind of, especially probably people that are 30 years or younger, a lot of them probably just kind of go, hey, that's that weird guy with the Afro that 
what did he do? So those people would maybe even benefit more to know more about this guy. Yeah, he's awesome. Oh, and for our visual lookers or whatever, we got a three, one, two, three paintings of mine here, very heavily inspired by Bob Ross, even though there's no trees on it because we got Mars, an ocean, and a black hole. But very cool. Very cool. But th- th- there was a there was a nice uh, troll moment. I don't even know. If- yeah, fuck, I'm going to say it because I thought this was hilarious. When they were talking about like how the joy of painting is only like 26 minutes long or 28 minutes long. And they got to, he has to be done with the painting by the end of it. Oh, yeah. And they got like one minute left and Bob Ross is just like mixing up some browns. He just puts a big brown streak right down the middle. It's like, well, now my producer is going to hate when I do this, but oh, let's go ahead. And, <laughs> and he just, just marks right down and they're like, figure what the hell is he going to do? And then we're just going to grab some phthalo blue and some titanium white and, and put it right there. And then he just somehow makes it, it's just a tree in the foreground. It just somehow makes it work. But that, 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 that little scene was pretty funny. And I uh, showed up, uh, especially like at that point of the thing, you kind of know that the producers are being a little asshole. So it was fun watching Bob Ross troll him for a little bit. That is very cool. Again, that is Bob Ross, Happy Accidents, Betrayal and Greed. It, it, it comes with a strong recommend from Rudy Sparky and Eric Holmes, currently streaming, I believe, on Netflix. Finally, we are getting, we are closing our, our, our episode, our weekly podcast for Find Your Film with What's in the Box by Bruce Sparky. But before we get to What's in the Box, you know, are you a little bit sad, uh, Bruce, at what, middle class film class as we're recording this? You, I, I saw a post. Are they off for three weeks? I know. I know they're going to be taking a brief hiatus, although they have some stuff to put out for us in the meantime. But oh, I was yeah. thinking, um, I think I was thinking of contacting uh, Tyler Noe and saying we need to do a special one-off of Perky and Noe, and just to make that happen, <laughs> that would be very Perky, Perky and Noe. That'd be very, very cool. But you know what? what even though he's on, vac- he's currently on vacation. He's kind of here with us in spirit. Eric Holmes, what does Pete do every week with us? Well, we're gonna put some white gesso across this, and uh, some phthalo blue, and some burn umber, and. And we'll just paint a little Pete here. And hey, hey, Pete, how you doing? Why don't you drop that beat? All right. Who's in the box? Oh, what's in the box? You lie. No. What's in the fucking box? (laughs) All right. So this week's What's in the Box is Eddie the Eagle. That was, I forgot who picked that for you, Bruce. Uh, Sally Colette. Oh, Sally Colette. Yeah, nice from uh yeah. oh, what was it from um um max cloud max cloud max, yeah, max cloud. cloud yes yeah. thank you my brain was not remembering the name i'm too old <laughs> this is on disney plus it might be some other places too but it's on disney plus directed by dexter fletcher i had heard about this movie forever and i just knew the vaguest idea of this movie which was i had remembered that back in one of the olympics there was this british ski jumper and he kind of became a, a big story at the time. And this is this is kind of the best version of a Disney movie, you know, where it's a Disney biopic. So it's going to be a crowd pleaser. It's not going to get dark, but it's a real story. And it's just just tons of fun. And the idea is, if you haven't seen it, have you both seen it? Or no, wait. Yes. Yeah. Eric, you've seen it. I haven't seen it yet. If you haven't seen it, uh, it the main idea is this, this young man from Britain named Eddie Edwards. Uh, it shows him from early on in his life. He's played by Taron Egerton. So he starts out as a clumsy kid. He's got braces on his legs. He's, uh, you know, and he's constantly, he's constantly looking at this book about, you know, different Olympians. And he wants to be, he always dreams of being an Olympian and he's just trying everything. He's always like falling. He's causing havoc. He's trying to jump things with you know, skateboards and his bike and whatever. And eventually he tries to take on skiing and he has dreams of being in the uh, Olympic ski team, downhill ski team with uh, England. And they're just like, nope, you're never going to be Olympian. You're not good. Just give up your dreams. And that's kind of the beginning of the story. And at his darkest moment, he looks up and sees that there have basically has been no ski jumpers for England since like the twenties. And this takes place in the late eighties. Uh, and he says, oh, there's my there's my opening. <laughs> no one's a ski jumper. I'll be a ski jumper, you know, without any training at all. And at this point, I think he was about 19 or 20, something like that. And yeah, he uh, kind of takes off with the family van to his father's chagrin and heads off to the uh, premier ski jumping training site 
in uh, Europe. I forget where it was in Norway or, or Switzerland, one of those places. And there he meets up with kind of a washed up ex skier played by Hugh Jackman. And um, the rest of the story is just kind of what you'd expect. You know, it's the underdog and it's, it's heartwarming, but it's actually a, just a ton of fun. This is just great. And then it's one of those movies, if they do it right, you want to see the real footage and they give you some of the real footage and go find the real footage. And that's a ton of fun as well. Eric, what do you think? What did you yeah, think? Was it one? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real sweet movie. And I'm glad that this is right after we're talking about Bob Ross. Cause this is kind of fits in that with, with the, uh, with the, uh, the worth and the powder keg earlier, like Bob Ross. And this is a great palate cleanser to finish off the, uh, off the episode. I, I just like Eddie, the Eagle. Like I, I like how his ambition is to, it seems to just try things. He's not worried about being the best at what he, he just wants to be able to do the thing that he wants to do. Hey, ski jumping. I think, and he does the, the 15 meter ski slope crashes a couple times, gets it. And he's like, well, we conquered that. Let's go on to the 40. <laughs> and they're like, dude, you're going to break your leg. And he keeps trying. He keeps trying. He keeps trying. As soon as he lands. Yep. Let's go to the 70 foot one. It's like, dude, you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> Stop it. But like, <laughs> he just has that kind of drive that he wants to keep doing this thing. And then once he feels that uh, almost once he feels that he conquered it, he wants to go on to the next thing. You know, he's not trying to be the best ski jumper in the world, but he wants to be the best ski jumper that that's in him. I guess if that makes sense. Um, and that, I think that's a good lesson for anyone to learn. A lot of times, you know, we talk about like, a, you know, just creative endeavors, like, oh, I don't know if I can be as good as so-and-so, or I, I don't know if this is as good. You know, I don't know if I can put this out there because, you know, it, it doesn't measure up to everything else. I think what Eddie the Eagle teaches is that that doesn't really matter. Just do your thing and make it as good as you can, you know, put as much heart into it as you can. And who knows? Maybe he'll be the number one ski jumper in Britain for 20 years. Maybe it's only by default, but that, I mean, that's still only because you went out and did your thing, you know, just, you know, just try to do the best that you can and fuck everyone else. Okay. That is some good life lessons from Eddie, the Eagle, both strong recommendations from Eric Holmes and Bruce Perky. Did you guys tear up a little bit at the, at the movie or no, no, no tears. Just, uh, just feel good stuff. Did a lot of laughing. Yeah, laughing, it's, mostly, laughing. it's mostly laughing. I mean, there's there's some heartwarming moments for sure. This is just like, like we were talking about with Bob Ross. It's like that perfect example of family entertainment, like in the best possible way. Like you, if you if you don't like this or at least enjoy it, I mean, you don't have a heart. Oh, well, I, I might not enjoy it because I don't have a heart. My heart is not. Who are we looking at? But my, my, I, my heart it doesn't beat. There's just a, a gold coin in the middle of my chest. And I'm just thinking of coins. Doge and, coin. He's got a doge actually, coin. Wait, wait, wait. wait what, what's is something shaking? Are those coins or are those like pa papers of movies? I, I forget. I'm, I think the coins are taking over. What are you shaking? Are you shaking coins, Bruce? What are you doing? You should, oh, oh, Bruce is actually picking something. What are you going to pick? I don't know what I'm going to pick. We're going to find I, out. I also want to say that I'm glad this came from Sally Cola because it kind of had that same kind of fun, kind of light fun that Max Cloud did. So yeah. I, I kind of, and, uh, you know, and a lot twist. of the movie. And twist yeah. too. And, and yeah. they, they have those kind of fun moments. So I, I can see where she would probably get a lot of inspiration from Eddie the Eagle because it kind of comes through in her writing, it seems. Yeah. yeah, is it interesting when you get a suggestion from someone whose films you've seen and it really makes sense? Like last week when we watched, uh, was it Valerie and her week of was Wonder it week or something? Of Wonders? Yeah, yeah. Like it, we watched it. it was like, oh yeah, I totally can see. <laughs> so yeah, you just kind of see that connective tissue. It's it's pretty interesting. All right, this is suggested by the one and only Matt Stillman. This movie mm -hmm. I have seen, but I probably haven't seen this since 1992 when it came out. And I remember it being a pretty great movie and one of the first appearances of. Billy Bob Thornton, I believe. One False Sling? Move. Oh. By Carl Franklin. One, one False Move directed by Carl Franklin, starring Billy Bob Thornton and also Cinda Williams. I remember actually for the UCLA Daily Bruin, I gave a negative review of One False Move. I didn't understand it at the time. And my buddy Aaron Dobbs to this day always, <laughs> always brings up my review of One False Move somewhat almost 30 years later. And I, just to show how much of an idiot I am. And again, that's another movie that I, I may actually finally have to rewatch when I'm not looking at my crypto chart, because this is a movie that I haven't got, have not gotten back to. So it's, I'm it, sure it's probably it, a classic. It might be with me with Candyman. You might yeah. watch it and just, I, I, has there been any movies like that where you guys just watch and then you watch again, like you watch and hate it. And then you just watch later on. Maybe you didn't yeah. love it, but at least you're like, 
that's not too bad. I, yeah. It was a little hard oh, on yeah. that. For yeah, sure. I'm assuming I'm assuming I was completely wrong on one false move. So that is going to be Bruce's what's in the box pick. Thank you, Matt Stillman. Matt Stillman, by the way, he's part of our cinematics Facebook group. Every time I, I wake up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, West Coast time, I always see a morning review from Matt Stillman. And it's always welcome. Thank you, Matt Stillman, for being a big part of our cinematics Facebook group. Eric Holmes, do you have anything to say before we get out of here? Well, I wasn't just talking earlier. That was kind of a leading question. But what's oh, the movie? Enough. What's the movie? Oh, what's the movie for me? That oh, um, that, that, that you hate it and you watch later yeah, on. Good, good that, one. That, That's not a leading question. Yeah, yeah, my bad. Yeah, I'd say whack the dog. I was in a bad mood. I ended up watching it several years later and realized I was a moron. And you, Bruce, what was yours? I'm trying to think. Maybe it'll be um, Sweet Girl. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a, you got me. You got me, listeners. I would love to hear what you think of Sweet Girl on Netflix. And you know what? We got to complete this this triumvirate. Eric Holmes, we, me, and Bruce, we're we're going to require you eventually, either next week or the following weeks, to actually watch Netflix's Sweet Girl and chime in whether I really yeah. enjoyed it. And Bruce, <laughs> let's just say Bruce is being very sarcastic on Sweet Girl. So maybe you, I want to see what I think you might enjoy it, Eric, or you might hate me even more because I made you watch it. So I don't hate you at all. So it's um, very be very easy to hate you more than I do because I don't hate you at oh, all. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Finally, Bruce Parkey, you're leading us out. Any thoughts? No, no, I'm, I'm good. I got nothing to say. <laughs> Bruce, has, <laughs> Bruce has nothing to say. Very, very funny. Very dry wit. Almost dry as worth. Okay, almost so dry we'll as see. worth. <laughs> almost dry as worth. Okay, most importantly, I hope you guys le- learned a lot from this episode. Think to yourself, think to yourself, what are you worth? Okay, and then we covered a lot of really wonderful movies. What is the movie that people should see out of all of everything that we want? We covered, Eric, Flash what of, do you think? All of them. All, all of them, Bruce. <laughs> what do you think? I'm going to say if you want to go in the theater, go see Candyman. Okay. There you go. All right. And I, I would give a recommendation, but I'm still still thinking Bitcoin, Ethereum, ETH. Hopefully next week it will be better. Hopefully these these uh, coins will get out of my brain. It's an addiction. It's not good. Stay away from it, kiddos. All right. We'll see you next week here on Find Your Film. Take care. <laughs>